and we are on location at the Catholic Marketing Network in Chicago. I'm Doug Keck, and we're joined on set by the president of the Writers Guild, Ellen Gable. Great to see you again, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, we featured a couple of years ago when we were at yes. one of the other shows and got a chance to uh, talk to you and several of the authors, which we'll be featuring on this particular program. Uh, now, you are an author yourself. Uh, Stealing Jenny was the book we talked about yes. in the past, and you have a new work, a little bigger than the other one. A little this bigger. One's, this one's a subtle grace, and it's also a period piece, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, it is a historical romance with some themes of uh, obsession and stalking. Mm -hmm. And basically it's about a girl who is a little impatient about meeting her husband. Back then, if you didn't have a husband and you're 19, you were, right, you right. know, kind of an old maid. Right, right. And she becomes very uh, impatient and kind of falls for the first guy that uh, shows any interest and he turns out to be trouble. Mm -hmm. So. Now it says here, A Subtle Grace, bracket, O'Donovan Family Number 2. Right, so my second book is In Name Only, which is O'Donovan Family Number 1. This okay. is the second part, although they're both standalone books. You can okay. read each independently of the other. And uh, does this, now you were Jersey, Philly in your past, yes. though you're up in Canada now. Yes. Is any of this, you know, based on your family heritage? No. Or where did you, where's no, the idea I, and why did you set it in I Philadelphia it, in the 18th century? I set it in Philadelphia. Well, I love 19th century. It's set in the yeah. 19th century. Right, the 18th century. I love, I right. love 18th, 19th century. Right, I love right. old, I love old photos. I love old anything, vintage stuff. I set it in Philly because I'm from the Philly area, mm -hmm. and my father took me to see the Liberty Bell when I was five years old, and I've been fascinated with Philly history since. So okay. I figured when I started writing historical fiction, I write both historical and contemporary, mm -hmm. but. When I started writing historical, I wanted to set it in a venue that I knew about. It's familiar. Right. Well, let me ask you, what's the difference between writing those two? Does it take a lot more research to write something in historical? Yes, a lot more okay. research. But one of the best things I did was I purchased online an 1897 Sears catalog. Okay. Fascinating stuff because it told me what they were wearing, mm -hmm. it told me what they ate, it told me what kind of diseases they had and were trying to cure and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. So best thing I ever did and it's fascinating stuff. Sure, after reading that, you're very happy you're not living during that time period, yes. I'm assuming, right? <laughs> I am, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> right, well let me ask you, you kind of mentioned these kind of dynamic things you talked about, obsession and all that. Now, there's some people who don't like Catholics who think they might be obsessed. But what's, yeah. is there a Catholic underpinning or a pro-life yes. underpinning in this? Yes, there are pro-life themes. There are actually theology of the body themes. Mm -hmm. Theology of the body is a fairly new term. Right. But the teachings are 2,000 years old. Of course, right. So yeah. uh, there are teachings about marriage and, and chastity and that sort of thing, and pro-life issues in the book as well. Right. Now you talk about here at 1896 Philadelphia, you talked about Kathleen being the, yes. the oldest daughter. Yes. Now, were you the oldest daughter in your family? No. Oh, okay. No, I was the second oldest. Actually, I'm the middle child in my okay, own family. Okay, okay. And you've got a Dr. Luke Peterson, the family's yes. new phys physician, also makes quite an impression on her. Yes. Except in this also, William, the oldest son, believes that God may be calling him to a religious vocation. Right, those so, are the two other So characters. are they a Catholic family, is that? Yes. Okay. Yes, they're a Catholic family, and, uh, and the... The uh, Dr. Luke plays a major role. He actually is the the male protagonist of okay. the of the book, uh, and he's a really great guy. But he's not this handsome uh, fellow that she initially falls for. Right, the other guy. Who okay. are we always saying the good-looking guys are really bad guys at heart? No, I'm not no? saying that. Okay, <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. But uh, but I just wanted to show that it's not always what is on the outside right, that is right. in a person's heart. That, right. And is that the lesson that she learns? Yes. I mean, that's the, she definitely that whole learns idea. That lesson, of yes. Now you've also got in there with, uh, uh, is there actually a pilgrimage in, to Rome that's yes. featured in this so, as well? So Pope Leo the Thirteenth makes a cameo role, okay. or cameo appearance. So, which is kind of cool. I, I actually found uh, YouTube videos mm -hmm. from, I guess, eighteen, the late eighteen hundreds of, of Pope Leo. Mm -hmm. and he was a very small, thin man. Right. And so that helped me in my research for, for that as right, well. Right, there's that famous shot of him kind of walking right. uh, out right. by the little carriage right. of the car. Right, I saw right. that. It's it really cool, see, right. really cool. It's amazing. So how long did it take you to write a book like this? Four years. Four years. Four years. And when do you write? How do you write? I write at night. I write 
when I'm sitting in the car waiting for my kids to come out of hockey, mm. I whenever I can. I oh, write when off. I take them. So you're a hockey mom. Well, I, I'm hoping not to be. <laughs> Soon? <laughs> Soon, yeah. We've got two sons. Now, you said you write. You kind of waved your hand a little. Do you well, write? I, write, I, just, so I you, just write. Do you I write longhand? Oh, yeah. Oh, when you yeah, do? I can. I can if I But if do you I'm type in. usually what you're oh, doing? Oh, I normally you are do, yeah. okay. normally. I, I'm I a, thought I'm maybe you had a quill pen or something in no. honor of the age. No, I I'm, I usually type on my computer, and I'm, I'm like, you know, 90 words a minute mm -hmm. typist, so okay. I'm, I'm very fast with typing. So does your typing outpace your storyline? Yes. Or, okay. <laughs> Most of the time it does. Do you have to go back and kind of rework it that way? Sometimes, How many yeah. passes do you actually make on a manuscript for yourself? Oh, it varies. With this one, probably five. Mm -hmm. That many because you're you're writing and rewriting. And this particular book now is this self-published? Then basically, it is self-published. Uh, I own my own company, and I so now when publish someone, others. I guess I'm asking that not because of the idea you couldn't get somebody to publish it, right. but the idea is there an editor or somebody goes and looks at it and oh, says, yeah. "Okay." I have a whole team. Okay. I have I have three editors. I have ten proofreaders. I have a lot of people that that helped me in the production right. of all the novels right. that we publish. Now, you're the president of the Catholic Writers Guild. What would you What would you say to the people out there who are watching EWTN, who feel maybe called that they have a story in them or something they'd like to write? What should they do besides maybe contacting your organization? I would say write it. Mm -hmm. Write it. Put pen to paper or whatever to computer, right. but write it because it will never it will never be there if they don't if, if don't they do don't it. do it right. And, and if you've got a work out there and you want to find out how you go about maybe getting it published and, and how self-publishing works and downloadable works, right. they can find that out from your organization too, Absolutely. right? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And we'll put your web address up there so people um, can find yeah. out. www.catholicwritersguild.com. Okay, great. Well, it's always great to see you. Thank you. Okay, Take thank care. you, Ellen. Good luck at the show. Ellen Gable. And here we have and Margaret Lewis. Hi, hey, nice. great nice to see you, you again. Doug. People Thank see you. you. Maybe a couple of years ago, we had you featured on. I think it was when the time we talked about the book "Murder in the Vatican: The Church Mysteries of Sherlock Holmes." Yes, that's right. Which I always thought was an incredibly interesting one. You got Pope Leo involved, etc. Now, my understanding is uh, that uh, you got some good reaction to this. Yes, I did. And it that very led well. you. That led you to the Watson Chronicles, a Sherlock Holmes novel in stories. Now, what's different about? Where's the setting for the Watson Chronicles? Now, the Watson Chronicles takes place um, at the end, kind of near the end of Sherlock Holmes' career, mm -hmm. and it's really written. Dr. Watson's more or less writing about his own life at that time, and it's not so much about the mysteries of Holmes as it is about Watson and his experience at that time, because mm -hmm. they actually broke apart. Right, it's sure. it comes become it comes to happen in that particular period that. Uh, that when he disappeared after the falls and everything. Oh no no no! He the, he died and came back, That's and then they right. worked together for another. 20 years and then right. Watson uh, he gets married and um, we don't know who this mystery woman was and that's kind of where this story came from mm -hmm. who did this woman marry and after that Holmes goes and retires to become a beekeeper mm -hmm. and we learn we read a couple stories about him when he was retired mm -hmm. um, and he also does one so there case are mysteries involved with those cases there's mysteries like involved, involved in this and in this particular story um, Watson, um, he, as they're starting to, to separate and go their separate ways, Watson falls in love with a woman who's much younger than him. She's Polish, she's Catholic, and she's an actress. It's like a triple threat. Okay. And um, basically, she befriends somehow Mycro uh, Mycroft, who's Sherlock Holmes' older brother. brother right, right. And um, now Sherlock has to figure out what her true intentions are. Okay, are What's they going just on? fair or is there something? Yes. That's untold. What's going on? It's going on here. Yeah. Right. And he, he and uh, so that's She's not the related big... to some pontiff later or anything like that, is she? No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> but it, it's it's more of a story of um, what is love all about? Uh -huh. And and really in this story, Sherlock is more the problem than the solution. Mm -hmm. um, well, and he's so a bit it's of an odd character, so I he's mean, a bit right. of an odd character. And so in this book, you know, you have Watson talking about his life, and you see Sherlock coming in and out and doing things, and you're going, why is he doing this? Mm -hmm. You know. And at the very end of the story, you find out why, and uh, he and everybody learns an interesting uh, well, lesson from that. Well, let me ask you. Obviously, this is you're part of the Catholic Writers Guild. Uh, this is the Catholic marketing network we're at. Obviously, your other book, Murder in the Vatican, clearly has some sort of Catholic connection. What is the Catholic connection or underpinning of the Watson Chronicles? Well, the main female in this book is Catholic, and uh, and she really does live her faith. Mm -hmm. And so, what I my concept was, um, what if this man Sherlock, who is very uh, 
he's very odd and he has this animosity towards women and he has all these things going on. What if he were dropped in front of someone who was a, a living embodiment of love, mm -hmm. of the of caritas, okay. you know, what we know is charitable love. Right. And how does he respond to that? And how do, and also how the other two principals, you know, Watson and Mycroft, how do they respond to that same type of person? She herself sees St. Therese as a model. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is when uh, St. Therese's book was first starting to come right. popular and she had, had the version in French that she had read, the character okay. has read that. And, and she tries to live the little way, even though she is an actress and an opera singer. Mm -hmm. So, and so she's got this very big life right. and she's trying to live the little way. And so how does that affect the people around her? And of course, Sherlock doesn't trust her one bit. Right. Well, <laughs> and also the idea, I mean, do you get an idea, I mean, is, is Sherlock religious at all? I mean, he seems very kind of secular. He is very secular, but science is his God. Science, it, it, well, he's not an atheist. Right. Um, we do know that because in one point of the in the stories, he says, um, "There's the goodness of providence is evident in the extras we have in life." And he picks up a rose and he says, "This flower is an extra, and we have much to hope from the right. flowers." We there are these things here, and so in in his own way, he's saying, "Yeah, God must exist because right. of these little extras, because only goodness gives be us in these a things." A sense, but right. right, it might be deistic in a sense. But well, let me ask you quickly, because we have uh, just a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Now, Watson marries this nice Polish lady. Catholic. Yes. Did he get married in a Catholic church? Does yes. He, does he convert? No. Okay. No. So but he's he get married outside <laughs> the altar rails. And, well, yeah, they do. They right, have to, right. yeah. Um, well, they have to be married in a special fashion. Okay, they so. get permission from the bishop to marry well, in, in, a, in need, a particular right. chapel, but okay. they, 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 it's pretty strict back then. They couldn't even marry, really, in a church a normally. Church at all, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so maybe we'll uh, continue to pray for Watson. Do you have another book in the uh, I have a lot of books in the works, yes. Okay, uh, it's, I have some things I'm working on. So I actually finished a science fiction piece recently, okay. working on a piece of historical fiction. So some different things before I take a detour, and I'll come back to maybe some more Sherlock. Because okay, he's a lot so, of fun. So if you missed uh, Murder in the Vatican, now you can get the Watson Chronicles, a Sherlock Holmes novel and stories by Anne Margaret Lewis, the Catholic Writers Guild. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good luck. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And now we're joined here from the Catholic Writers Guild by Margaret Rose Reilly, uh, two of her books, A Garden of Visible Prayer and also Cultivating God's Garden Through Lent. Now, what's interesting about this, this is all about gardening. It is. Now, your dad, did he own a greenhouse? Yes, I grew up in uh, the greenhouse industry, the green industry, actually, and the greenhousing part of it was what his father had begun when he came in from Germany, came to this country from mm -hmm. Germany, and we had that for many many years and I can remember as a child we would hide under the benches and run among the flowers mm -hmm. it was a glass greenhouse and we had about um, an acre under glass right so what's the idea but what, what creating a personal sacred space one step at a time what, what do you mean sacred space how does a person do that well a lot of gardening is is mentioned in the Bible and it had lost its way in our society and we, we lost the agrarian aspects of some of the things that were taught and I found for myself, I'm, I'm a bit of a, an anchoress, and, and I liked the privacy and the, the moving into the space of mm -hmm. a garden as part of my prayer, and even more so as a, as a Benedictine of late, that that really fed my spirit. And I wanted to find a way to bring that to other Catholics, uh, that it's not a new age thing to be spiritually grounded in the garden in an outdoor space, you know? Right, right. It's not a bad thing to be a tree right. hugger. It can be abused and people have yes, abused yeah. that in the way they described it, but right. Now you you also say you, you've kind of laid it out in a systematic way so that, what, so the average person can use this as a guideline? Exactly, and that's, okay. it was uh, based on the work that I had been doing at St. Francis Retreat Center in DeWitt, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And we had built um, many gardens there, and a lot of people were asking, well, how do I make a spiritual space of my own, mm -hmm. whether for community or for private purposes? Right. And so I took the information from the classes I had developed, um, and we created this book from that. Mm -hmm. And it has a, um, I call it the three Ds. Mm -hmm. You first um, discern what leads you into a prayer space and an outdoor environment. Mm -hmm. Then you learn how to design it. And I teach people how to do it in a way that they don't have to be horticultural, art attacks, you know, that kind of thing. So you don't yeah. have to do a you lot of landscape. You don't have to be an expert to make no, it work. You don't no. have to call the yard crashers to come and fix <laughs> it for you or something like no, that. No, it, it's very simple. And awesome. then after you have discerned and then drawn out some kind of a design, you look into actual development and putting it into um, the space outdoors. And some of the things you mentioned here in the book, uh, 
uh, plants of the Bible Garden, the Marion Garden. Uh, you can make stepping stones for home stations of the cross. What would be like in a Marion Garden? What would that, when you say create a Marion Garden? A Marian Garden has actually a, a specific definition in the Catholic tradition, and it comes from Saint Fiacre. Um, so say Fiacre, but uh, he had developed the first Marian Garden and used from the Bible um, a garden enclosed. My okay. love a garden enclosed. So when he developed that garden and it was dedicated to Mary, there was a fencing, an enclosure of some type, a wattled fence. Okay. So a Marian garden would typically have some sort of framing around it. It mm -hmm. could be very simple with a little white picket or some stones. Mm -hmm. It could be elaborate with um, a lot of your mm -hmm. your public facilities have tall shrubs, okay. you know, to, to frame it. Uh, a rosary garden, which is also considered part of a Marian garden mm -hmm. sometimes, but that is a little less enclosed, a little less structured. Mm -hmm. You would have, of course, your um, rosary uh, like replication as, like of some sort. Like a little fence or a little rosary Well, there's a number of ways of doing the rosary garden, right. and one of them that I'm working on developing now is actually using the little plastic Christmas orbs mm -hmm. and putting them on top of the, um, well, they use them for cement, mm -hmm. you know, right. that okay. uh, rebar. Right, rebar. Yeah, right. and you're right. putting those little colored balls on top right. of the rebar throughout and your garden. creating that. Yes, and then you really don't have to change the landscape. You just incorporate the rosary in now, that way. People also sometimes include a statue of Our Lady or something like that. In a Marian garden, you would right. definitely have that. If okay. you're doing a rosary garden, you would have a smaller statue, but you mainly would start the entrance with a cross. Okay, now another book you have here that's kind of ties into that is cultivating God's garden through Lent. How is that different? Now, is this when you suffer along with the plants during the <laughs> winter, or how does this work? Um, that is a collection of the blogs that I had written on Pathios Catholic Channel. Okay, so you're a blogger too, right? Yes, okay. yes. And um, those stories are reflections of, I might get a seed and, or remember something mm -hmm. and uh, when I'm doing my prayers, and I would take, this whole book was written in, in Adoration Chapel. Okay. Yeah, handwritten. Each each story was was a memory or a thought, and incorporating that into a theme with Lent. So mm -hmm. each week, Lent has a particular theme to it, such mm -hmm. as uh, development and growth, or suffering, mm -hmm. or storms and things like that. So each day fits within uh, that that group, and it's a timeless right. book in oh. the sense that it's not uh, a, it's not a dated book of meditation right, that so we're accustomed to right so you can use it every seeing. year right? e every year well i like this palm sunday of the passion of our lord broken branches yeah right you think of that and you have different things in here leaves yeah. in the rain for the fourth week uh the clouds etc so a way for you really to to bring in a sense to life your Lenten experience in a way yeah, to and kind grew, of relate to it. And it grew out of the first book. Right, because yeah. the first book tells you how to develop these spaces to see them as sacred. Yeah. And the second book actually takes and reflects on some of the things you might find in that sacred environment. Well, well like you said, it's, it grew out of one into the other. So that's perfect. Well, thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. It's great to have you stop by here. Thank you. Uh, enjoy your work with the Catholic Writers Guild. And thank you for stopping by here at CMN at the uh, event in Chicago. Thank you. Two of your books, A Garden, A Visible Prayer, and also Cultivating God's Garden Through Lent.